You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly On Demand from KFI AM 640. Let me tell you about Michael Berkheimer. He was dining with his wife and friends at a chicken joint in Hamilton, Ohio. He had his usual order. He likes boneless wings with Parmesan garlic sauce. Ate it as normal, but he felt a piece go down the wrong way. You've ever been eating and you feel something like go down your windpipe or something. You start coughing. It's really unpleasant, very painful. But three days later, Berkheimer felt feverish. He couldn't keep food down, felt very ill. He went to the hospital emergency room. A doctor discovered that there was a long, thin bone which had torn his esophagus and also caused an infection. Berkheimer, and I think rightfully so, sued the restaurant, which is called Wings on Brookwood, and said the restaurant failed to warn him that the boneless wings, air quotes, could also have wings, excuse me, bones in them. And the lawsuit also named the supplier and the farm that produced the chicken damn. Claiming all three were negligent. In a 4-3 ruling last week, the Supreme Court, the Ohio Supreme Court, ruled that boneless wings refers only to a cooking style. And that Berkheimer should have been on guard against bones since it's common knowledge that chickens have bones. Berkheimer's lawsuit was dismissed. And the court also ruled that boneless chicken wings can have bones in them. Now, um, what does that mean if I were to uh, get a meatless patty and then it had meat in them? Should I have been on guard for meat when it should have been a meatless patty? I'm being serious. No, yeah, I hear you. Uh, If I'm advertised one thing and this could have turned out deadly for him, Mm -hmm. if he didn't go to the doctor soon enough, why is it his responsibility to assume that because chickens have bones in them, that in a product advertised as not containing bones, he should make the assumption and be on guard for bones? No one has ever ordered chicken nuggets and expected nuggets to have bones in them just because they, air quotes here, come from a chicken, that makes no sense. I'll do you one better. When I go to McDonald's, when I ever go to McDonald's, and I should get a hamburger, should I expect bones in my burger because cows have bones in them? That's right. Buyer beware, buddy boy. Is that, is that, look. The court just ruled that words have no meaning, okay? <laughs> I, I, this makes no sense. <laughs> now, here's the thing. If I go to a restaurant, okay, and I order fish, it is my expectation because I know that fish can have bones. I expect the fish to have bones because for the most part, it comes on the bone. But if I order fish and it's deboned, like a I fish going, fillet, like, so like a fish fillet. I'm going to have a righteous complaint if I find bones in because I bought it to not have the bones. That's how it was advertised. I don't see how it's, in a, it's a reasonable assumption to expect something that was advertised that it's not supposed to have. It would be different if it's just fish cutlet. It would be different if it just said chicken parts. You, know, you, know, right. yeah. you don't know what you're going to get. But when you are specifically purchasing boneless chicken... The only expectation is it shouldn't have any bones. Yeah. Yeah. Not even that it should taste good. That at the minimum, it shouldn't have bones. Because that's what it's being advertised at. I, I, don't, I don't see how anyone can go to any restaurant or establishment and consume any product which is completely opposite how it's being advertised. And then blame the uh, the customer. I don't even understand how the court, and again, this is an Ohio Supreme Court, so that says a lot, but <laughs> how an Ohio Supreme Court rules that boneless chicken wings can have bones. How does the court even 
put that together. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, if if I were to go to the grocery store and buy some milk, does that mean that there I should be on guard for for bones in the milk? Because again, cows have bones. I'm just trying to follow the logic here, which hmm. there's none. Yeah. Well, it's like it's like Schrodinger's cat, except in this case, it's Schrodinger's bone. You don't know if there's going to be a bone in it unless and until it tears your esophagus. Right. Right. But still, where does the responsibility lie? Are you saying that me as the consumer, it's my fault because my esophagus got torn by a bone that shouldn't have been in there? Yeah, it's almost as if you have some problem somehow living in a libertarian hellscape <laughs> where you're not safe from anything. I, I, don't, I don't know what to do because anything I bought. Go ahead, Stefan. I was going to say this kind of reminds me of when you watch those uh, car commercials and you'll see people driving like crazy on the on the freeway or driving off road and they have to put it at the bottom because I'm sure someone did it uh, uh, cl closed course with a professional driver. And it's like you almost it's like, do they have to do that with boneless now? Well, I can <laughs> yes, understand do. people doing stupid things, but in that commercial, to use your analogy, they are not saying that if you buy this, you get to do that. You know, they're not making that one to one comparison. If I buy, like, for example, if I buy that truck, to use your analogy, I think it's a reasonable assumption that the brakes should work. They sh it shouldn't be on me to assume that the brakes don't work when I'm given a car which is supposedly passed a five point inspection and it's safe to drive out on the road. No, no, the free market will work all that out after enough people die. You don't understand how the free market works, clearly. Well, and it may not be a one-to-one -one comparison, but if you give me boneless chicken wings, it's not a reasonable assumption that it might have bones in it. It's not a reasonable assumption that it might have feces in it just because it comes from an animal. I mean, how no, far do you no, want to take this? No, I was actually thinking, how far does this go? Because if I buy, say, now a burger, I buy some meat or anything at a restaurant and say it's gone bad. Right. All these places in California, you get all these warnings. Trader Joe's has the listeria lettuce or whatever, whatever it may be. Right. Are we then to say, well, it's now to be expected that after a certain point of time, food can go bad. Cause, so, you know, that's reason. Right. It's reasonable. Buyer beware. As Mark said, I, it, it doesn't make any sense. It strains credulity, as they say, that you're going to blame the person who was wrong and has a legitimate medical issue because of the food legitimate it no one thinks that it's okay that you go to a chicken joint and there's a good a chance even a slight chance that you may come away with a torn esophagus did you notice in this story if that was the end of it or if it's going to be appealed I, i'd like to see this bone thing go all the way up to the supreme court well i don't know what they can do with it i don't know if it was dismissed with prejudice or not it doesn't say so i don't know if he can refile it i don't know if he can I don't I don't know. We need a dispositive bone ruling. I just don't like what this says for the country because what starts in Ohio, now this can be used everywhere. Well, the, what you're talking about is, is case precedent. And yes. this could have all sorts of unintended consequences or even intended consequences for similar situations where you can point that. Look, uh, Ohio Supreme Court made it clear that you should expect bones in your boneless food or if there's a um or let's talk about peanut allergies if you're sold a food which is not supposed to have peanuts in it is it a reasonable expectation that there might be peanuts in it or peanut oil or something which could have um, a deadly effect on someone who's allergic to it oh yeah there's trace elements of peanuts everywhere how That's, do you expect to avoid that Come i'm on. being i'm being serious right with yeah. trace elements absolutely yeah, that's the upshot of all this. You can't trust anything, and it's on you. Good luck. Sink or swim, buddy boy. Now, there's also the, the debate that we've had before. You know, boneless chicken wings, are they actually wings? I say they are. They're not. What are you saying? <laughs> They're not. That's an adult chicken nugget. A boneless chicken wing is nothing more than an adult chicken nugget be clear. Oh, so I should have a reasonable expectation that it didn't come from the wing part of a chicken? How do you know if it does? 
it's not shaped like a wing anymore. It's not like the McRib where it's shaped like a rib sandwich and has the bone impressions. That's not what it is. It's not shaped like a wing. It's just a strip of meat now. Oh, so I should have a reasonable expectation that of, a, of an actual bone in a McRib because it's shaped like a rib. Is that what you're insinuating? I'm saying that they don't need to call it a McRib. That's a McLie. <laughs> Okay, okay. It's later with Mo Kelly. KFI AM 640 live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app. We'll tell you about the top 10 cars stolen right here in California. You may want to find out if your car is on the list or if it's already been stolen. You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly on demand from KFI AM 640. The National Insurance Crime Bureau investigation says that one over 1 million cars were stolen last year. And with an increase from 2022 to 2023, California is the state with the largest number of auto thefts at 208,668. And just in case you're curious about the 10 most stolen cars here in California, well, we have that information for you. Coming in at number 10. Kia Sportage. And I expect a lot of Kias on this list because it's the only key, uh, any only car that you can steal with a USB cord. Coming in at number nine of the most stolen cars in California. Ford F-150 pickup. Yeah, that's a popular one. Number eight. Kia Forte. Why don't we just say if you have a Kia, your ass is on this list. Just skip to the end. Number seven. Honda Civic. It doesn't say what year. So Still just assume. Though? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, look, it's always been a good one. Yeah, I got a Honda Civic, you know, so I've always thought it eventually it was going to get stolen. Coming in at number six. Honda Accord. That's not surprising. Yeah. Honda Accord is usually on the list. And hey, look, we know a lot of these cars are stolen because they're easier to steal. And a lot of these cars are stolen because they're easy to, to uh, sell the parts of. Coming in at number five of the most stolen cars here in California. <laughs> Kia Soul. Yeah, if you have a Kia, you won't for long. Number four. Wait a minute, where's my rim shot? That was funny as hell. That was funny. Come on now, I'll wait. That's not a rim shot. Yes, it is. Give it to me. Thank you very much. Working the refs. (laughs) Uh, Coming in at, what we got, number four? Yeah, number four. Chevy Silverado 1500. Truck, obviously. Coming in at number three of the most often stolen car in California. (laughs) Kia Optima. Damn. Every single brand and model. Coming in at number two of the most stolen cars here in California, which has the largest number of auto thefts. Sonata. I'm just asking why you bought one in the first place. Oh, I, I can at least understand why someone bought a Kia. Those are kind of nice looking cars, but a Hyundai. Those are some ugly ass cars. Oh, man. And then to think that you're going to have it stolen? You stole an ugly ass car? You bought it and, and had it stolen? That's insult to injury. That's for 7 Eleven robberies. Pretty much. Pretty much. That and Kias. <laughs> I don't, but see, I, I look at a Kia and it's like, that's a nice looking car. Well, they, yeah, but they also redesigned them. But the the new Hyundai's are pretty nice. They are. I think so. Not oh. the the because I think I know what you're thinking of, and I can see why. Like you're like, eh. I like the I like the new. I, I've always liked Kia. They're kind of sporty. I, I like them. You know, I just wouldn't buy one, and I would never buy a Hyundai. Never coming in at number one, according to the National Insurance Crime Bureau, of the most often stolen car here in California. Anyone want to take a guess who hasn't seen the list? Anyone? Toyota Camry. Uh, Stefan, 
Any any guess? That's yeah. a good guess. The, yeah, the Accord would have been my guess, so that's already on the list. Okay. Yeah, I would have said Honda Accord. Yeah. Mark, any guess? I would have guessed Honda as well. That's what I drive, and I live in perpetual fear of it not being there when I go out to get into <laughs> no, it. No, it's true. Yeah. It's true. It's one of those easy access cars. Yeah. All right, coming in at number one with the gold medal. Another car I don't understand why anyone has. And if you're driving one right now, I'm not sorry. I meant it. I said it. Oh, dang. But who goes to a, a, a lot and says, ooh, I got to have that Hyundai Elantra. Just got to get that Hyundai Sonata. Just have to have a Hyundai. And I say this, just coming back from Kia, everybody's driving a Hyundai over there for obvious reasons. Everyone has a Hyundai. Really? It's a Korean car. Uh, That's why everybody has a Hyundai. The taxis are Hyundais. The police cars are Hyundais. Really? Yeah. No, really. That's oh, that's kind of cool. Well, no, they're cheap enough so that if you smash <laughs> one up, you can just get get another one out of the closet, like one of Schroeder's pianos or Look, something. It's not like there's going to be a high speed chase. Okay, they're not chasing anyone down. They don't. They don't need like a a V8 Interceptor or Ford Falcon. They don't need um a. a a Grand Torino. A Charger. Yeah, they don't need any of that. <laughs> Look, it's a Hyundai. The, the, no. No. You weren't going to see a Hyundai in uh, Smokey and the Bandit or no. Vanishing Point <laughs> or any Fast of those. Fast and the Furious. Yeah, it's, like, yeah. it's like the slow and not very angry. <laughs> yeah, the, the cautious and budget conscious. Go ahead. Give it to me. Thank you very much. Two in one segment. It's later with Mo Kelly. KFI AM 640. We are live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app. And did you know... That you, as an adult, may be autistic, just undiagnosed. We're going to find out what are some of the signs and symptoms. That's next. Well, it's later with Mo Kelly on KFI AM 640. Live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app. There's a promo that we have on KFI, and it's talking about how I felt that was weird and awkward and out of place and everything when I was a kid and now as an adult and weird and awkward and all that kind of stuff. It's true. When I was a kid, I thought I was really different. There was something, I don't know if it was wrong with me, but I perceived the world differently than other people. And as I got older, I think like, yeah, I'm still different. Can't put my finger on it. I just look at the world differently, not viewpoints, but just how it appears to me visually. I have a uh, synesthesia, where I see colors and it corresponds to a certain sound. Like if I see red, it has a certain note to it. If I see blue, it has a certain note to it. All of that. Other weirdness, when I was growing up, I had all sorts of OCD. And then I came across this article, which talks about the nine biggest signs of autism in adulthood. Do I think I'm autistic? I don't think so. But there's a lot of evidence to support I'm probably pretty near the spectrum, if not on it. And Mark Runner, I think you would get a kick out of this as well, because you and I are very alike in many ways. I just assume we've all got the, the same problem. No, seriously. seriously. I think there's something where we see the world appears to us very differently than most people. All right, here are some of the signs. And this is about diagnosing autism in adults, not children, but adults. And it's felt. It's uh, a recent study found that some 80% of adults with autism are still undiagnosed at age 18. And I know when I was a child, they were not diagnosing autism or determining if a child was on the spectrum. So it wouldn't be something that would even apply to me. But as I get older, it's like I have some weird, weird OCD habits that I remember as a child, which were really obsessive. And now I look back and think, I wonder how I would be looked at today. Here we go. Uh, the first one is a feeling of being different from others. All the experts shared that it's common for autistic people to feel different. Okay, that's kind of vague, but yeah, that corresponds to at least my feelings growing up. Also, a difficulty with social cues. Someone with un undiagnosed autism may find that they have trouble deciphering how much eye contact is appropriate or when they should stop smiling during a conversation. That doesn't apply to me. 
I just assume you never make eye contact unless you want to be attacked. Yeah, I I had to learn. I, I have to think about that because eye contact, a lot of times I may not look at someone because I'm thinking. And when you make eye contact with someone, sometimes it distracts you from the thought you're trying to hold. But it's not an unwillingness that you would see many times with autistic children. I know, um, Tawala, you work with neurodivergent children and and young people are on the spectrum. So, and you know how it presents itself. Yes, I work with children uh, who have a primary diagnosis of autism at our school. And so that's why when I look at this list and I look at how they're defining this as adult autism or autism in adults, I'm like, mm, sounds more like this is just a broad way to say you may be on the spectrum, which would be more accurate because mm-hmm. there are significant symptoms and things that go into an actual autism diagnosis that this is covering things that just to me, I'm like, okay, you're on the spectrum. Got it. But to say it's, it's autism that this is a bit of a leap. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Also, someone with undiagnosed autism, again, with air quotes, Mm -hmm. a confusing relationship history, both romantically or platonically. Well, I don't know how I should interpret that. Quote, there might be relationships that have that kind of suddenly burst apart, but the autistic person doesn't understand why. When it comes to the reason behind this complicated relationship history, it's likely that the person with autism doesn't know why their relationships fail when other people's don't. Well, mine failed because the other person was wrong. Unclear. So that doesn't apply to me. Okay. It's her fault. (laughs) Okay. Sensory differences, and this absolutely applies to me. Sensitivity to sensory input like noise and sight is another potential sign of autism. The person is either hyper aware of a sound or totally unaware. People who are not autistic tend to be more or less responsive to sensory stimuli. For example, an autistic person may find that they're constantly aware of a ticking clock at a friend's house. Here's a true story. This is why it jumped out at me. I cannot sleep in a room where there is a ticking clock. Well, how could you? I will hear it all night long. Of course. No, but I'm saying other people like, it's just a clock. No, I will always hear those subtle sounds because my ears are attuned to micro sounds i will hear the dog barking i will hear the siren in the distance i already told you about synesthesia i am really really connected to sound and sounds can drive me crazy now outwardly it's not something that i will act out but it's something inwardly like look you know i got it i've taken clocks out of room and put them in another room because i can hear the 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 minute ticking Mm. so that's something that jumped out at me here's something else A desire for routine. Many people with autism thrive on consistency. If they move homes or move careers, that that could create a season of insomnia or anxiety. That is me all day. I do not like change. If you know me, I wear basically the same stuff every week. I'm being... I'm being honest. Oh, no, we both do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll wear my polos, the same polos, the same shoes, socks, and because it's about comfort and consistency. Well... I think of it in terms like the Einstein thing where you don't want to use up your bandwidth figuring out what to wear. If, if right. Most, if most of your stuff looks the same, that's less garbage you have to worry about in a given day. I, I will obsess in my closet about what I am going to wear it and still end up with the same stuff. I will obsess about did I um, cl- lock the door, but now I can do it from my app so I don't have to worry about it. I will obsess. Like when I'm leaving my dojong, did I lock the door? I, and, and I will, it will just, it will consume me. And I'll think about it. Like I, for, I mentally didn't remember whether I locked the door to the dojong, my martial arts gym when I was leaving. I have a key and, and it just bothered me all weekend. Does, I, does I didn't the want to turn uh, stove around. in the oven bother you like that too? Yes. Same. Yes. Absolutely. The if same. I don't have the mental memory of actually turning it off or whatever, I will be obsessed with it. And there are other things that I'm not going to discuss on the year, <laughs> but they're, they're just things that I will obsess over because my mind won't let it go. In other words, bathroom things. Yeah, but kind of. Say, I, 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 <laughs> kind I know, of. but a lot of this uh, falls under compulsive obsessive. That's yeah. what I'm saying. It's it's on the spectrum. That's, that's why when I, see, when I saw this story, I'm like, who wrote this? Someone who literally 
is giving such a broad brushing of what they think autism is. And, and, and that's why this, this whole article is, I'm like, change, change the titles, you know, nine biggest signs you are, uh, OCD? obsessive. You have OCD. Yeah. Okay. Make it that. Right. Well, let's go on. It says a need for solitude. That's me. Quote, needing solitude to recharge after social situations or really overstimulating situations. For example, when I leave here, and Twala, you know, when I close out the mic, if I aim 640, we're live everywhere in the iHeartRadio app, and I lock out for the night, how soon before I've hit my car? Oh, by the time I turn around. <laughs> I turn around. And talking about solitude, when I'm driving home, and oftentimes when I'm driving in, there's no sound. I do not have the radio on. Other times, if I'm listening to Nori, but that's about it. And But a lot of times, it's complete silence. You're raw dogging it like the young kids on airplanes. Yeah, but I, I want to be able to completely disconnect. Completely. I don't want any sound. I don't want any stimuli. I just need to completely. Re- that's why I'm saying like, nah, should, I'm not saying I am, mm-hmm. but it makes me think about it. Well, on some level, these things are kind of like horoscopes too, though, where they're yeah. so they're so vague, so general. They apply to everybody, and there's also a lot of overlap in the symptoms from one thing to another. OCD, the spectrum, uh, whatever. Uh, I mean, how could you miss anybody with some of this stuff? All right, how about this? More intense interests. That's more OCD. We can skip on from that one. No, uh, no, I, I fit that description. That <laughs> I resemble that more. Listen remark. to this: a dislike of small talk. That's me all day. I hate going to cocktail parties and and engaging in small talk hate it yeah i always feel like there's a basketball shot clock (laughs) and it's like 15 seconds before i say something that's going to horrify somebody and end my career right and and there are social cues which keep me from being a complete a-hole but it's not natural for me yeah which leads into the next one i'm sorry Stephen. no a desire for direct communication i need to go i need to go from a to b say what you mean Get to, let's get let's get, skip to the end, please. I was I was gonna do you one better, like talking about cocktail parties. I'll sometimes slow down so I don't get on the elevator with someone that I don't know. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Because I don't want to have that uncomfortable moment. Because I don't want to look at you. I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> and it's really it's really difficult. And I was talking to everyone of like, hey, when I'm not at work, I don't talk about work. And if by chance someone should recognize me and they go into the conversation, I'm not trying to be rude, but I'm probably not up for the small talk. It's it's hard for me. It really, really is difficult for me. I can talk. Obviously, it's what I do. But I'm saying it's not my comfort zone. We're I'm really all autistic, like that. all of us. Maybe, maybe. But there's always something. And I've noticed about personality, radio personalities, by and large, were weird. No the question. people that I've worked for socially awkward all crazy i am not going to talk about any of the people here you can come to your own conclusion about <laughs> bill handel jock Ovelt, tim conway jr i'm just saying because i'm not going to speak about them but i'm saying the people i've worked for definitely definitely weird well you have to be a little bit crazy just to get into this line of work but just to specify all of the authority figures we work for are perfectly normal. They're perfectly normal. And no problems whatsoever. Nothing unkind to say about any of them. No, no, no. Not any of them at all. Look at the time. You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly on demand from KFI AM 640. We're over last segment, but we have to continue this conversation because I know someone was listening when we were talking about adult autism, undiagnosed, how it may present itself in you know, in our everyday lives. And, and if you're of a certain age, you might not have been diagnosed. It was very general, but it got me thinking about some of my quirks, some of my idiosyncrasies, some of my massive OCD that I struggle with to this day. And then our news editor, Bethany Brown, came running down the hall. And Bethany, what did you say to us? I said, oh, my gosh, I cannot believe you're having this conversation right now because I was just talking about it earlier. Um, And I felt like it related to me or I related to the conversation so much. I struggle with my OCD. Like I didn't say on the air, I wear ankle socks because if I wear longer socks, I have to pull them up all day long. I have to make sure that the seam of my sock is not touching my foot Mm -hmm. or I will take off my shoe wherever I am so I can make sure my sock is correct. It, It can be debilitating at times. Yeah, absolutely. And I think for me, 
I recently was talking to a psychoanalyst that I have because I've <laughs> I've introduced the idea that I might be autistic or somewhere on the spectrum. And they explained to me that OCD itself, which I'm diagnosed with, um, is extremely similar um, in certain ways. For example, when you get overstimulated, as you talked about earlier with yeah. like loud noises and things like that, and kind of becoming like emotionally reactive mm -hmm. to being overstimulated. Um, so they said the biggest difference is just autism is an intellectual disability and OCD is more of a mental disability, a mental health. Issue. All I know is I'm different, okay? And yeah. It's not like I'm trying to be <laughs> diagnosed or claim the title of being autistic or anything like that. I just know that the world doesn't present itself to me the same as other people. No, yes. I'm I mean, okay. you talked about like, yeah. you remind me of just how I eat food and everything. I eat the same food. I get California um, fish grill every single day. Mm -hmm. Every day, the exact same food because I know it's going to taste a certain way and it'll keep me calm. And I'm being serious. You separate yeah. it. You do not let, uh, you know, they don't, your no. food, and you don't eat the leftovers. All those things. I have to eat it in order. So you in order. Part. Yes. That, From that least is. to most enjoyable. Well, it's, your, it's your safety. It's yeah. your safe place. You're like, this food makes me feel safe. I've had it a billion times. And I know it's going to make me feel good. Right. Or at least I'm going to enjoy it. I'm not going to like experiment with the food. Uh, no. No. <laughs> mm -mm. Yeah. yeah. But, but the difference, the difference with... Uh, especially with some of the children and some of the young, when I say children, I'm talking young adults as well that work with, there is that you do not want to because it makes you uncomfortable, I say with you, but you can. Intellectually, you can. You can sit there and you can eat this food in a specific order versus children who literally cannot without there being a shutdown, an actual shutdown and a behavior. Let me jump in there because, for like for example, I cannot sleep with drawers open in my room. I cannot sleep with like drawers, cabinets open downstairs in the kitchen. I will get out of the bed and go downstairs into the kitchen and close all the cabinets and drawers and in the drawers in the bedroom before I can go to sleep. I'm barely at the point where I can go to sleep with the closet door open. Severe OCD. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. As someone who's diagnosed, I can say 100%. Well, thank you. So <laughs> let's, since we're diagnosing people, what's wrong with Mark? Oh, don't get me started. How much time do we have? <laughs> well, first of all, if the closet door is open, then whatever's in there is going to come out as soon as you close your eyes. Well, that's, yeah, that goes back to childhood, but that wouldn't be my OCD. Oh, okay. KFI AM 640 live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app. I don't know what you're thinking, and I kind of like that. Keeps it fun. K. And KOST HD2. Los Angeles, Orange County. Live.